She's the food and drink editor for Slate Magazine and the columnist who's always there to tell you when you're doing it wrong, Laura Anderson. Hi, um, I'm Laura Anderson. Thank you so much for having me, Eleanor and Katsinia. I am here today to talk about the 2000 Lasse Halster movie, Chocolat. It is about a drifter played by Juliette Binoche, who is half Mayan and half French, and she moves to a small conservative French village with her young daughter in the early 1960s. And she opens a chocolate shop, and she, over the course of the film, convinces the villagers to loosen up and sort of, you know, just embrace their sensuality. So there's a lot going on in this movie. There is an imaginary kangaroo, <laughs> which I imagine someone has already written a dissertation on, probably. Um, there's a scene where Juliette Binoche is sopping wet and she crawls through mud while sobbing. Um, and then there's also Alfred Molina doing one of the worst French accents ever committed to film. Um, so it's a very, there's a lot going on in this movie. But what I'm going to talk about today is stereotypes about chocolate and women, and particularly women's sexuality. So uh, several months ago for Slate, I wrote an article about the stereotype that women love chocolate. I'm sure that you are familiar with this stereotype. It's just the idea that women are crazy about chocolate and that we crave it all the time, but like especially when we are you know, having PMS. And there's also this idea that like women like chocolate better than they like sex. So I looked into this, and it turns out this is a pretty uniquely American phenomenon. So there was a study done a few years ago that compared American college students with Spanish college students um, in terms of their chocolate cravings. And American college students reported this big difference between men and women in terms of self-reported chocolate cravings. Women reported craving chocolate a lot more than men did. But there was no gender difference in terms of the Spanish population, which seems to indicate that it's a totally cultural phenomenon. And it also turns out that it's a pretty new stereotype, um, historically speaking, um, so like for, you know, most of history, chocolate was sort of seen as this kind of sexy thing, you know, possibly an aphrodisiac, but it wasn't really until the 1960s when there were these twin phenomena of uh, women's increasing economic autonomy and then also sexual liberation that led uh, advertisers to start to um, sort of target men and women differently. And so advertisers started to tell men, hey, if you give a woman chocolate, she will give you sex in return. And they started telling women, hey, you don't need a man, you have chocolate. Chocolate will give you all of the pleasure that you could possibly desire. And so there are these two kind of like related, slightly contradictory ideas, but it's sort of this like transactional idea where chocolate is substitute substituted for sex, chocolate can be exchanged for sex. So I'm going to make this huge generalization and say that there are these two possible worldviews about chocolate. There's this American worldview in which it's, you know, this kind of transactional thing. It's very highly gendered. You exchange chocolate for sex. And then there's this European worldview where it's sort of like, you know, more communal, like everyone can enjoy it. It's equal opportunity. There's nothing gendered about it. This kind of more like socialistic idea of chocolate. So let's see which of these stereotypes Chocolat embraces. First things first, there's definitely a relationship between chocolate and sex in this movie. Uh, the main character, played by Juliette Binoche, her, the character's name is Vianne, she is presented as a very sexual person. She is shown wearing a lot of red in this movie, which is sort of like this trope, like none of the other characters wear red, but this is sort of like a hint that she might be a very sexual person. For some reason, there's this scene early on where she is painting her new store, her new chocolate shop, and she's wearing this ridiculously low cut blouse. It doesn't look like a very practical blouse to be wearing when you are painting a store, and yet she is wearing it because you can't help it. She's just too sensual. Um, <laughs> she, she, she makes this kind of chocolate that is known as the nipples of Venus. They're like these little bonbons that are shaped like nipples, basically. And um, in case those hints are like a little too, bit, uh, too subtle for you, we also find out very early on in the film that she has this young child, but she's never married. She doesn't even know who her daughter's father is. Clearly, she's been sleeping with a lot of people. And in case all of that is way too subtle for you, then like later on in the movie, she also has sex with Johnny Depp on a boat. And they have shockingly little chemistry in this movie. It's really amazing that they have no chemistry at all. Um, so now I want to look at the effects that the chocolate that she makes have on the people who eat it. So this is, here, I can talk over this because there's no dialogue. Um, so one of her first sales is made to this kind of frumpy housewife. Um, she sells her some bonbons and then she gives her this free little bag of cacao nibs, um, which she tells to give her to her husband, that's her husband. Um, because it will awaken the passion. So let's see what happens when he actually eats these cacao nibs.
Okay, so those are some pretty powerful kakanas. They definitely did what they were supposed to do. But notice what goes on here. So like, this chocolate is very powerful in terms of arousing sexual passion, but it's sort of a reversal of what we think of in terms of our American stereotype about chocolate and sex. It's not a man exchanging chocolate for sex. It's a woman exchanging chocolate for sex. So that's kind of a reversal. And now I want to show you a clip in which the character played by Judy Dench, who is the landlady of Juliette Binoche's chocolate shop. Her character is played as this kind of like salty, grumpy, closed off old woman. She's like very no nonsense. So let's look at what happens when she enters the shop. Oh, she's doing fine. I think it's good for her, you know, seeing new places, meeting new people. Your cinnamon looks rancid. Well, it's not cinnamon, it's a special kind of chili pepper. Chili pepper and hot chocolate? Mm -hmm. It'll give you a lift. Um. It tastes like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so already she's opening up. And then we have this like interspersed scene which showing Julie Binoche's daughter, it's like this other plot line. And then let's see what happens immediately after that. All night with him. We swam naked in a tun. <laughs> At dawn when I returned to my house in my bed, my mother poked her head in and said, wake up sleepyhead. <laughs> no idea I'd been gone. There. Something better. Um, so chocolate is better than booze. Um, in case you missed it at the beginning, Judy Dench is telling the story about this time that she went skinny dipping with this dude. So like this is again some powerful chocolate. It like changes this kind of closed off old woman so that she's suddenly telling you know you all these secrets about her sex life. And so there's this other clip that I want to show you. This is the last clip I want to show you. There's this kind of ridiculous, you know, exoticizing, othering backstory about when Beyond's parents met. So her father is supposedly this French pharmacist and her mother is this indigenous person from Central America. And um, so we're going to see the story about how they met. So her father has traveled to Central America to uh, do some kind of research. It's not really important. <laughs> One night, he was invited to drink unrefined cacao with a pinch of chili. The very same drink the ancient Maya used in their sacred ceremonies. The Maya believed cacao held the power to unlock hidden yearnings and reveal destinies. And so it was that Georges first saw Jitsa. Now Georges had been raised a good Catholic. But in his romance with Chitza, he was willing to slightly bend the rules of Christian courtship. Okay, so again we've got chocolate functioning as this kind of like seduction tool slash aphrodisiac. But again we've got this reversal. It's a woman using it to seduce a man rather than the other way around. So there is this plot line in the movie in which chocolate does sort of like take the place of a man. So there's this character played by Linda Oland who is in an abusive marriage. And at the beginning of the movie, she's this like total hot mess. She's a kleptomaniac. Her hair looks horrible. She like, you know, she can barely like string together a sentence. And then eventually she meets Vian. She starts tasting chocolate. She gets up the courage to leave her husband. And by the end of the movie, look, she's very, very happy. And she looks, you know, incredible. It's like chocolate has worked wonders on her. So in this sense, it's like chocolate is sort of, I mean, she, she also starts to like work in the chocolate shop. Um, so she kind of like gets this newfound independence. So in this case, it's like chocolate is sort of taking over this role of a husband, basically. But I think the more important 
lesson to be drawn from this storyline is that not if you have chocolate, you don't need a man, but if you have a job, you don't need a man. I mean, this is a feminist fairy tale basically set in an era when feminist causes were pretty black and white. And I feel like that's sort of what this plot line is going for. And also I think is chocolate is what brings Josephine, the Lena Olin character, and the Juliette Binoche character together. They form this friendship. And there are these other relationships that are formed um, with the aid of chocolate. We've got Judy Dench and her grandson, um, previously estranged, but because of chocolate, they come together. And then like, you know, she just like makes all these friends in the village and they all come together to make chocolate at the end of the movie. It's like chocolate is just like bringing people together, not necessarily in the sexual way, but just in this sort of community way. And so I would argue that Chocolat sort of embraces some American ideas about chocolate and this idea that it's very sexual and in this idea that like it can possibly replace men. But overall, I feel like it takes a sort of more European view of chocolate um, in the sense that it just brings people together and that men and women can both enjoy it. And overall, it presents chocolate as being, I think, a symbol of women's strength and empowerment as opposed uh, to a symbol of women's weakness, which is how we often see it. So I think we can all get behind that message. <laughs> One more hand for Laura Anderson. Thank you so much.